I'm gonna give it to you straight right before we start. It's gonna take me a while in this video to actually get around to talking about firewalls themselves. And that's because if I just start the whole firewall discussion with entanglement and complementarity and, and, and horizon blah, and paradoxes, it's like it's gonna be nonsense to you. So I wanna build up to it so we can actually understand it. I perfectly realize that at the end of this video, even after doing all that work, that it still may not make any sense, but I have to at least try, okay? I want us to actually understand this concept and where firewalls are coming from and, and discuss whether they might or might not actually exist. And so to get us started, we have to take like 20 steps back away from firewalls. Remember, patience is the key here because we are dealing with black holes and black holes make like no sense whatsoever. We need to take 20 steps back and we need to talk about event horizons. Event horizons are probably like the defining aspect of a black hole. It's what makes a black hole a black hole. Remember, to make a black hole, you take a bunch of material and you squish it down below a certain radius. The uh, radius is called the short shield radius. It depends on how massive the object is. For example, you could take the Earth and squeeze it down to the size of a bean, and you would have a bean-sized black hole. You could take me or you, preferably you, and squeeze you down to the size of like an atom, and you'd have an atom-sized black hole. And you can take like a star that's like 10 times the mass of the sun and crunch it down to be, you know, a few miles across. You end up with a black hole a few miles across. Now, all that material, all that stuff, gets compressed down into an infinitely tiny point called the singularity. No, the singularity doesn't actually exist. We don't know what's actually at the center of a black hole, but that's a separate video. But surrounding that singularity at a specific radius, again, that Schwarzschild radius, is called the event horizon. The event horizon really does separate one section of the universe from the other. It separates the outside universe from the universe inside the black hole. In this event horizon, the most important property, the property that is going to bedevil us for decades and has for decades and like is at the center of all these discussions is the fact that it is one way. Once you cross the event horizon, you cannot leave. Nothing can leave. You cannot send light signals or information. You cannot travel outside of it. It is the point where the space time that is flowing into the black hole starts to travel faster than the speed of light. And so if you try to leave, you have to travel faster than the speed of light and you can't move through space time faster than the speed of light. Yes, space-time can move itself, can move faster than the speed of light, but you can't move through space-time faster than light, so you can't escape. The fact that you can't escape is what makes black holes black. The f this is what locks stuff inside of black holes, and this is what is going to cause problem after problem after problem, as we will see. And eventually, we're going to get to the concept of the firewall to try to solve all these problems that this one-way membrane, this one-way boundary creates. Now, in general relativity, which is our theory of how we, how we understand black holes, how we discovered black holes, the event horizon isn't actually a boundary. It's not a thing. It's not a wall. It's not a place. You know, there's not even like lights or something to tell you that you have crossed the event horizon. It's just a mathematical boundary. It's a certain distance where once you get that close to the black hole, you can't leave. That's it. That's all the event horizon means. But general relativity, our understanding of gravity, isn't our only way of understanding black holes. We can use our other tools of physics to try to understand what's happening at the singularity, which we completely fail at, and we have no idea what's going on at the singularity. And we can also use these tools to try to understand what's happening at the event horizon. And the first person to, to really do their one of the first people to do this was Stephen Hawking back in the 70s, where he was studying what happens at the event horizon, not just in the 
gravity picture and the general relativity picture, but in the quantum mechanical picture. You know, what happens? What does quantum mechanics have to say about the event horizon? He discovered that quantum mechanics has a lot to say about the event horizon. It has some very counterintuitive things to say about the event horizon. In quantum field theory, which is our modern theory of quantum mechanics, uh, in this view, you know, there's a lot of different ways to interpret this, a lot of different languages you can put on the equations. Uh, I'm going to go with a certain phrasing here that I don't necessarily say agree is the most accurate, but it does do the job for painting the picture that I need to paint, which is the firewall picture. Uh, and so go ahead and check out my other videos on quantum field theory if you want a more accurate interpretation of the mathematics. But but in this view that we're going to adopt, uh, the vacuum of space-time is nothing like a vacuum at all. It's actually a frothing, seething mass of foam of particles constantly popping in and out of existence. They, they come into existence as pairs as a particle and it's antiparticle. And then they look around for a little bit and they get really, really scared and then they find each other and annihilate. And so the energy that they borrowed from the universe to exist, they give back. So they appear, they're like, oh, wow, sorry. Like you're walking into the wrong room. Or if you actually like walk into the wrong, wrong restroom, you're like, oh, my bad. I'm just going to get out of here. And then you return that energy to the universe. And so in quantum field theory, this is constantly happening, including at the boundary of a black hole, including at the event horizon. What Hawking discovered is that occasionally these two particles can pop out of the vacuum, a particle and its antiparticle, but one is on the good side of the event horizon, the other is on the bad side and they can't get back together. The one that's on the good side wanders off, and the one that's on the bad side can't escape. It gets locked into the black hole. And for various mathematical reasons, because this particle was ejected into the universe, that's a cost. Like someone's got to pay for that. And who pays for it? The black hole pays for it in the form of losing a little bit of mass. And this is called Hawking radiation. And the black holes in this picture very slowly emit photons, electrons, some light energy stuff and slowly lose mass over time. Okay. This is just the what happens when we combine quantum mechanics with our knowledge of the event horizon. But Stephen Hawking and others very quickly discovered that this leads to a little problem. And this leads to a little problem when we start trying to count up and keep track of where the, all the information in our universe goes. If, if you have a system, a quantum system, a classical system, it doesn't matter. There's, there's information in that system about its state, uh, about its position and momentum and, and spin and, and, and electronic charge and just blah, 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 all sorts of information. This information cannot be copied. This information cannot be destroyed. You need this information. We believe this to be true because in physics, we use the state of a system to predict where it's going to go, how it's going to behave. And so if you know the final state of a system, you can work backwards to know its initial state. And if information can be destroyed or copied, then that causal chain is broken and like all of physics breaks down and then so does like the universe because cause and effect are completely broken. So... What does this have to do with black holes and event horizons? Well, when this happens, when the Hawking radiation happens, Hawking's original calculations showed that the radiation was what's called thermal, which just means random. It's just noisy. It's, it's like static. The, the radiation coming off a of black hole is just empty noise. It doesn't contain any information. But through the process of Hawking radiation, eventually black holes disappear. They go, they shrink and shrink and shrink and they go, Poof, and they're gone. So Hawking rightly asked, and others rightly asked, like, wait a minute, what happened to the information? If all this information piles into the black hole and then it gives off Hawking radiation that cont contains no information at all, and then the black hole disappears, where did the information go? This is called the black hole information paradox and has been a problem for like 50 years now. We do not have a solution to this paradox. We do not know what happens to all the quantum information that fell into a black hole. 
There have been some ideas, though. One of those ideas was introduced in the 1990s by Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose thought that maybe, hang on with me here, because this is going to start sounding a little bit loopy, and already, like, hawking radiation by itself is loopy. By the time we get in firewalls, we're going to be maximum loopy. So right now we're at the medium loopy level with this idea of black hole complementarity. This is Penrose's idea from the 90s to solve the black hole information paradox. The black hole information paradox comes from our us not knowing what the heck is going on in the black hole event horizon. Under complementary, Roger Penrose suggested that there are two different points of view. There's the point of view of the person, the information, the object actually falling into the black hole, and then the point of view of everybody watching from outside with horror and or delight, and depending. From your, let's say you fall into a black hole. Again, it's going to be you, sorry. You fall into a black hole. You're full of information. You know, you have, you, you're full of quantum mechanical particles in their states. You remember what you had for breakfast. You remember your favorite color. This is all sorts of information. You fall into the black hole. You cross through the event horizon. General relativity says there's absolutely nothing special about the event horizon. There's no boundary. There's no wall. You just sail on through la di da di da Oh my gosh, there's a singularity in front of me. And then you fall into the singularity and you die. The end. All the information gets locked up. Penrose's suggestion was that for our us on the outside have a different perspective. From our perspective, you approach the black hole. You get closer and closer to the event horizon, but you never quite cross the event horizon. And instead, you get smeared all across the event horizon. You get locked there for eternity. And you just hang out there all gooified across the surface of the black hole. And then your information does come out in Hawking radiation. He said maybe Hawking wasn't exactly right that the, that the radiation that comes out is perfectly thermal, totally random, just static noise. Maybe it does contain that information the information of everything that fell into the black hole and, and, and it's just in these subtle correlations between particles and the in the radiation and eventually all that information does leak out I know this sounds loopy because you're like, wait, it doesn't mean there are two copies. One copy of the information goes inside the black hole. One copy of the information stays on the outside and I thought you just said Paul that you're not allowed to copy quantum information. This is where the word complementarity comes in. Because the event horizon essentially separates two universes. There's the universe inside the black hole and the universe outside the black hole. And they can never communicate. You can never compare notes about outside and inside the black hole. So, yes, there is information inside the black hole. And yes, there is information outside the black hole. But since we can never compare notes, because we can never talk, because we can never access both versions of the information at the same time, nothing is strictly broken. These are complementary viewpoints. You can either have the viewpoint inside or the viewpoint outside, and that's it. You can never have both. And so there's no copy of the information. There's just two different perspectives of the same information. Does it sound like cheating? Don't worry. Like This is a very common thing in quantum mechanics. In fact, it's called complementarity, and it's totally legit. And in Penrose's idea, we solve the information paradox because the information does get preserved on the surface and then comes out later through Hawking radiation. Here's where the idea comes and in, gets into trouble. One, we don't actually have the sophisticated mathematics to understand this whole black hole complementary. These are all just guesses. This is like hand-waving, but a mathematical version of hand-waving. Like maybe this is true, but we don't actually have a functioning theory of physics that describes this whole process, which, you know, it's kind of lame. But after Penrose, some other physicists were poking around with this idea and they found a major problem. The major problem has to do with entanglement. So entanglement is what happens when you have two particles or several particles that are strongly correlated. Their quantum states overlap, and so there's a single unified quantum state that describes them. Entanglement is used for quantum computers, quantum teleportation, quantum cryptography. It's like it's, like it's a feature, another weird feature of the quantum universe. 
they found that uh, in order for Penrose's idea to work, for this complementarity idea to work, you need all, all sorts of, of entanglement. You need particles, uh, the Hawking radiation particles, the particle-antiparticle pair, they need to be entangled with each other. Information that eventually leaves the blood, the surface of the black hole needs to be entangled with all previous iterations of information and entangled. And so there's just a lot of entanglement. Let's just leave it there. Okay, what's so bad about that? They found that because of all this entanglement, that as the Hawking radiation is proceeding and the black hole is, is losing its information, Remember, information got on the surface of the black hole, and then now it's slowly leaking away. By the time the black hole is about halfway done evaporating, it's lost all of its information. And the entire mathematical construct that we use to do this whole complementarity thing breaks down. So once again, the event horizon of a black hole is causing trouble. Because it's saying there's all these entanglements, and because of all the entanglements, you end up losing more information than you think. Once again, we are at the black hole information paradox. It's just dressed up in a tuxedo this time. You know, it's not Hawking's originally original formulation of what happens to the information. Now it's like, well, there's complementarity and entanglement and versions of the information that go in and version and versions of the information that stay on the surface. And then those, but then you have to, and then you end up with the exact same problem of what happens to all the information. You're stuck. It turns out black hole complementarity doesn't solve the problem that you need it to. It just puts in different clothes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, like 15 minutes later, and, tr and trust me, this is the short version, we are now at the firewall. The firewall is an attempt to rescue black hole complementarity. Black hole complementarity was an attempt to rescue the information paradox. The information paradox was an attempt to rescue Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation was an attempt to rescue understanding quantum mechanics at the boundary of a black hole at the event horizon. So this is just one manifestation of a long-standing problem in physics of trying to understand what happens at the boundary of a black hole. What the firewall hypothesis suggests is that the entanglement that is necessary for all of this complementarity to work, all this information loss, all this like delicate system, the entanglement is broken. By breaking all these entanglements, when the black hole is doing its Hawking radiation thing, it doesn't carry away too much information. Hopefully, we actually haven't worked out the math on this. We just hope this works. And because all the particles aren't entangled, then you don't carry as way as much information as you think. And so, if the paradox is saved, the paradox is solved, the process of breaking entanglement releases energy, just like breaking a chemical bond or a nuclear bond releases energy. And so the, the vision of the event horizon of the black hole radically changes that instead of being just a mathematical place that you only know from equations, you don't actually experience anything different. Instead, it is a seething wall of energy that's hanging out right at the event horizon. And this seething wall of energy comes from all the energy liberated from all the entanglements that have been broken. The energy breaks apart all the entanglements of your information, which releases more energy, and so it sustains the firewall. We can't see this firewall from a distance because it's hanging out at the event horizon itself. And we can't see the event horizon. So from the outside observer, you're just like, no, it's totally a black hole. But then as you get close, then you, as you cross that event horizon, it becomes a very, very special place. It becomes a place where you are fried to a crisp. In this picture, none of the information makes it down to the singularity and all of the information stays on the surface. And so eventually all the information goes away in Hawking radiation. Yes, it solves the paradox. It solves the black hole information paradox because like, you can account, hopefully, if, if all the math works out, you can account for all the information. But 
it totally breaks our conception of what the event horizon should be. According to general relativity, the event horizon of a black hole is not a special place. It is not a wall. It is now not a boundary. And now the firewall is saying, yes, it is a wall. Yes, it is a boundary. It is breaking general relativity in a very major way. Maybe general relativity needs to be broken in a really big way. We don't know. Ultimately, the whole solution to black holes, to singularities, event horizons, Hawking radiation, of f firewalls, complementarity, information paradoxes, paradox I, I don't know, all of it ultimately rests in a quantum theory of gravity. That is where the ultimate, the real answer is like, what the heck is actually going on at black holes? The answer rests inside of quantum gravity. We do not have a quantum theory of gravity, hence all these headaches. The information paradox, complementarity, the firewall. This is like, we're, we can't solve the real problem, which is quantum gravity. So instead, we're, we're trying to take off little slivers and poke at it and prod at it and try to come up with guesses because maybe we can like inch our way to a solution of quantum gravity through this roundabout process of trying to understand what happens to information at black holes. Do I think of firewalls around black holes that like actually exist? I don't know. I don't know. And truthfully, nobody knows. We don't know if black holes have firewalls. We do not have a, a fully self-consistent, self-realized solution to the information paradox. That solution sits in quantum gravity land, which we can't reach. So we're just like knocking on the door and like trying to peek it in the windows. And when we peek in the windows, we get things like firewalls, which firewalls make no sense. Like, but something has to give. We, this much is apparent. Either like Hawking, our conception of Hawking radiation is way off. Our theories of quantum mechanics at near the event horizon are way off. Uh, general relativity at the event horizon is way off. You know, one or all of those has to be true. Something has to give. We just don't know what. If you want the firewall to be true, then you have to give up that event horizons are not special places, which may be true. But maybe that is true. Maybe general relativity was like nailed it when it came to that. And instead we have to give up um, our understanding of quantum information. Maybe we have to give up our understanding of quantum mechanics near the event horizon of a black hole. Maybe we are so far off base that we're not even in the same zip code as a solution for quantum gravity. Maybe we're just barking up the wrong tree. And I hate to be pessimistic about this, but it, you know, it is going to take a lot of outside the box thinking to understand black holes, to understand quantum gravity. The personally for me, the firewall is intriguing and interesting, and we should definitely pursue ideas like it because we've got nothing else or all the other alternatives are just as wacky. But on this, on the, on the other hand, I don't necessarily think a firewall idea is correct but I don't know what a correct answer does look like. So that's it. That's firewalls. Do they exist? I don't know. I suppose we could just jump into the nearest black hole and find out. Too bad we wouldn't be able to tell anyone else. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in our next video. Um, like, share, subscribe. Do all the usual stuff. I really do appreciate all your support. And patreon.com slash PM Sutter. It keeps these videos going. Honestly, I do appreciate it. I love making these. And I'll see you next time.